From movies to shows to animation and video games, Disney has been making Star Wars content for a little over a decade now. Many say Disney ruined Star Wars, many say it saved the franchise, but what is the truth? In this video, we are going to reflect on every major project that Disney has released. This will include my personal opinions on the project, along with an analysis of its impact on the Star Wars brand as a whole. I'm going to give each project a score from from 1 to 10, and then at the end of the video I will give the entirety of Disney's tenure with Star Wars a final grade. Since I can talk about each project for a long time, I'm going to try and limit each one to one page in my script, which is about two minutes. Let's begin with the movies. Oh, and spoilers for everything, by the way. The Force Awakens. I kind of wish I wouldn't begin with talking about a sequel film because most of you will probably turn the video off when I say this, but to this day, I still love the movie. Criticize J.J. Abrams' ability to write all you want, but The Force Awakens was a wonderfully directed movie. After seeing some of the many pitfalls from the Disney Plus shows, watching the sequels again, and especially this movie, just reminds me of how well this movie was directed. I know a lot of people hated where the new characters ended up in the later films, but I thought this movie did a great job job at setting up those characters. The biggest complaint people have with this movie is its similarities to A New Hope. But to be honest, that's not my biggest issue with the film. Sure, I would have preferred the movie to be a bit more original, but all the best parts about this movie are the parts that are original. So the rehashed stuff like Starkiller Base doesn't annoy me. My biggest issue with The Force Awakens was its poor world building. The movie begins with a new rebellion and a new empire, and doesn't attempt to explain the origins of either existence. Now, how did this movie impact the Star Wars brand? I want to emphasize here that I'm only talking about this movie alone and not the sequel trilogy as a whole, because at this time, this movie was a major success for the Star Wars brand. People were talking about Star Wars again, and don't let revisionist history tell you that people weren't dying to see what was going to happen next. The two years between the release of this movie and Episode 8 were some of the most fun times to be a Star Wars fan. I think the fandom and the brand are at its best when people are excited for the future stories and are actively discussing the previous ones, and that was surely the case after the release of The Force Awakens. The biggest mistake I think The Force Awakens made, however, was making the main conflict of this era of Star Wars basically be a repeat of the Rebels versus the Empire. That decision has handicapped so much of what others have tried to do, so I gotta criticize The Force Awakens for that. This is a movie that I still love, so my personal score will be an 8 out of 10. And looking at the movie's impact on the brand, I will also give it an 8 out of 10 because it was mostly positive. That averages out to an 8 out of 10 for The Force Awakens. Rogue One A Star Wars Story this is a movie that always gives me mixed feelings. On a positive note, the Battle of Scarif is one of the best battles put to screen in the past decade. It wasn't just the action of the battle that was great, but also the message the battle conveys. All the main characters of Rogue One die, sacrificing themselves not to destroy the Death Star, but to give others a chance at destroying the Death Star. The most noble of sacrifices are the ones that are for something not guaranteed, and that's what the entirety of Rogue One is about. The Battle of Scarif wonderfully executed that, and that's a big reason why the battle is so great. Now, the other parts of the movie aren't bad per se, but they are certainly not great. The characters in this movie I don't find to be well developed. Jin was interesting a bit, but her motivations never hit home for me. The other members of Rogue One I could say the same for. I wish this movie spent more time developing the group as a team of people that cared for each other, rather than just throwing them all together in this one movie. Now, while this movie certainly didn't have the same popular as The Force Awakens at the time, it did have a similar impact. Rogue One was the first of the Star Wars spin-offs, and these were ideas that I loved wholeheartedly. At the end of the day, The Mandalorian and Ahsoka and the other shows are spin-offs, and they were greenlit because of the success and the potential of Rogue One. Rogue One told a daring story with new characters, and it had the balls to kill off all its main characters. Since the release of Rogue One, most of the spin-off stories have been titled after a singular person. 
Jackson. And I wish Lucasfilm went back to a story like Rogue One. While I feel it lacked good character development, it did attempt to develop the characters while also exploring a fascinating story idea. Who were the spies that stole the plans to the Death Star? I love that. Rogue One also led us to Andor, which I find to be arguably the most daring project Disney has done with Star Wars. My personal grade for this movie would be a 6 out of 10, heavily flawed but still entertaining, and my grade for its impact on the franchise would be an 8 out of 10, like The Force Awakens. It did a lot of really good things for the brand. This gives us an average score of 7 out of 10 for Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. The Last Jedi Oh boy, here we go. I can talk about this movie for over an hour. I've literally done that before. If you've seen that video, you would know I love this movie. Anything that has to do with Rey, Kylo Ren, or Luke, I thought was fantastic. The depiction of Luke in this movie is the biggest topic of debate. I happen to be one of those people that really appreciates his portrayal and the story Ryan Johnson tried to convey through Luke. The story of someone who lost everything, mustering the courage to save the galaxy, I find to be inspiring. The Last Jedi is also also the movie that made Kylo Ren one of the most complex and interesting villains in the franchise. One thing that most Star Wars fans can't agree about with this movie is that it's probably the best looking Star Wars movie by a mile, and it certainly is that. My biggest issue with the film is the stuff with Finn and Rose. I may like this movie as a whole, but I don't love every part of it. The whole Canto Bite sequence was poorly done, and it took Finn down a narrative path that I wasn't a fan of. Now, as much as I love The Last Jedi, I cannot ignore or the nuclear damage it did to the brand. This was the project that sparked so much division in the fanbase. The vitriol and hatred spewed between Star Wars fans has not stopped since the release of this movie. Even though I love Luke's portrayal in this movie, I am not oblivious to the fact that most people hate it. Making Luke this depressed suicidal hermit is certainly not a decision you want to make if you're trying to please your viewers. Now while I do completely disagree with the notion that Episode 8 boxed Episode 9 into a narrative corner, The Last Jedi didn't leave people with much momentum for The Rise of Skywalker. The Force Awakens left people dying to see what would happen next, and The Last Jedi did not do the same. Yes, I love this movie, and I would give it a score of 8 out of 10, but the Star Wars brand has not recovered from the damage this movie did, and for that reason, I'm gonna give it a 4 out of 10 in terms of its impact. It wasn't a failure by any means, because there are a significant portion of people who do love this movie and the sequels, but it cannot be ignored that more more bad came from this movie than good. So those two scores average out to a 6 out of 10 for The Last Jedi. Solo A Star Wars Story Ah, uh, Solo, the movie that bombed. It's unfortunate that the box office of this movie is kinda its legacy because the movie is nowhere near as bad as the box office suggests. It's just not really all that good either. Solo is a film that I have total apathy towards. It's fine, I could put it on and watch it and be entertained for two hours, but that's not something I'm gonna go out of my way to do. Surprisingly enough, the portrayal of Han Solo by Alden Ehrenreich is not an issue most people have with the film. He did a good job, and I have no ill will towards him. The biggest issue people have with the film is that it's a film most people didn't want to see. Of all the possibilities of spin-off stories Lucasfilm could tell, they went with a movie about a young Han Solo. People love the character, but they aren't too invested in his past. When this movie was greenlit, Lucasfilm still believed the only parts of Star Wars worth exploring was the original trilogy. So that means a film about one of the main characters of that trilogy would be great, right? No. So it's hard for me to critique this film because it doesn't really try to tell any kind of compelling story. The movie is just a series of events that play out with somewhat good action and somewhat engaging characters. Now what impact has this movie had on Star Wars? This is a tough topic to analyze, because from a wider scope we all know that the failure of Solo led to the future spin-off films being either cancelled or turned into Disney Plus shows. Had Solo done well, then Obi-Wan would probably have gotten his own movie rather than a TV show, which most people agree is a good thing. But on the other hand, if this movie did well, then would we have gotten The Mandalorian? Would that have been a movie too? I think where Solo's impact is obvious is with how the film diluted the Star Wars brand. To go from $3 billion films to a movie not even scratching $400 million, it was clear that people just didn't care to see another Star Wars movie. People don't want to see Star Wars go down the Marvel path, and the box office numbers indicated that. Most people think the movie alone is fine, so I 
I'd give it a 5 out of 10 because I agree. While the film didn't divide the fandom even further, it did kind of dilute the Star Wars brand, so I'm going to give its impact also a 5 out of 10, which averages to a 5 out of 10 for Solo. The Rise of Skywalker the Rise of Skywalker is a movie that's fun at times, but it's just a mess all around. I still love seeing these characters on screen, but the narrative direction Lucasfilm took these characters was disappointing. Rey being a Palpatine instead of a no one was a decision I don't hate, but I prefer they hadn't done. This movie more than The Last Jedi butchered Finn into a useless supporting character. Bringing back Palpatine only to kill him off in the most anticlimactic way possible felt like such a waste. The highlight of this movie is also the movie biggest failure. I love every moment of Ben Solo in this movie. I don't think his turn back to the light side was rushed at all. I loved the brief glimpses of his personality we got with him on Exegol. So while I love the character and the way he was portrayed in this film, I stand by the belief that killing him off at the end was the biggest mistake Lucasfilm has made with the Star Wars brand. Even sequel haters kinda like the character. Overall, the film was a mess, but arguably worse was the impact it left. The Last Jedi made people angry but The Rise of Skywalker kind of just left people apathetic. They didn't care about this trilogy anymore. I love this era and I love the characters, but it's obvious that most people don't. When it's mentioned that the shows like The Mandalorian will eventually tie into the sequel trilogy, most people kind of groan and go, oh yeah, that's gonna happen, isn't it? You will be hard pressed to find someone out there more excited for the new Rey movie than I am. I'm so curious to see what direction Lucasfilm takes this new era of Star Wars, but right now most people aren't too excited. They'll go see it because it's Star Wars, but I don't know how many people are eager to see it. I promise you whatever that movie's box office ends up being, it would be $300 million more if Ben Solo was still alive. Not having Ben Solo around for the post Rise of Skywalker timeline is such a missed opportunity, and that's why I feel it was Lucasfilm's biggest mistake. As a sequel fan, I can enjoy this movie, but I'm not oblivious to its major flaws, so I'm going to give it a 4 out of 10. This movie left almost no positive impact on the franchise, so I'm going to give that a 2 out of 10, which gives The Rise of Skywalker an average score of a 3 out of 10. The Clone Wars Season 7 Moving on to animation, The Clone Wars Season 7 was huge. I don't want to talk about the first two arcs because, let's be honest, no one really cares about those eight episodes. It's all about the Siege of Mandalore. The final arc of the series has some of the best Star Wars storytelling that I have ever seen. Almost everything this arc does is perfect. The first two episodes of the arc are about the actual Siege of Mandalore, and it was perfectly done. The duel between Ahsoka and Maul was a major highlight and is to this day the most impressive feat of animation Lucasfilm has accomplished. Compared to the clunky fights of the early seasons, this fight is so smooth and flawless. The last two episodes are all about Order 66, and the tension here was executed perfectly. Scene after scene continued to impress me. The final seconds with that cold feeling that the Clone Wars was all for nothing was such an excellent way to encapsulate the themes of the show, that ultimately it really was all for nothing. This was a fantastic ending to the Clone Wars. One could argue that its impact on the franchise was even greater. When this final season was announced, it was during the height of the fandom's toxicity in 2018. For a brief moment, most fans were excited about the same thing again. Also, allowing Filoni to finish his series that was abruptly cancelled almost a decade prior brought so much goodwill to the fans. When fans' biggest complaints about a show or movie is that they wish they had gotten more of what you put out, you know you're in a good spot. Ever since the success of The Mandalorian Season 1, Filoni has made it pretty clear that he wants to build a mini-universe involving all the projects he's worked on, and wrapping up The Clone Wars was a part of that. This final season also allowed Lucasfilm to launch The Bad Batch. Continuing Star Wars animation is something I find to be really important, so regardless of my thoughts on that series, the existence of The Bad Batch is a win, and we have the final season of Clone Wars to thank. The Siege of Mandalore is without a doubt a 10 out of 10, but because the first 8 episodes exist and they aren't that great, my personal score for Season 7 is going to be a 9 out of 10. Through uniting fans and paving a path for future animation to continue, its impact is a clear 10 out of 10, which leaves the season as a whole at a 9.5 out of 10. Star Wars Rebels 
There's a chance that I'm the biggest fan of Rebels on the planet. What this show did for me is encapsulate everything that made the original trilogy great and translated it into a four season animated show. I know this show isn't perfect and it does have a lot of filler, but every negative thing I have to say about this show is from the episodes that aren't important. And everything good I have to say is about the episodes that are important. Each and every one of the Ghost Crew characters is perfectly fleshed out and well realized. I can't say I dislike any character of the main cast. That's an impressive thing to say about a show. Even though I love almost every character, Kanan is the one that resonates with me the most personally. He began the series with fear that he would never make a good Jedi, and ended the series as arguably the best example of what a Jedi should be that we have ever seen. The finale of Rebels is in my top three favorite moments of the franchise. All the reasons I love Star Wars are present in this finale. Ezra's sacrifice is just as powerful as Kanan's, and the Battle of Lothal was perfectly done. I I just love this finale and this show. Yeah, it's not a perfect show, but it's perfect for me as a Star Wars fan. Rebels has also left no negative impact on the franchise, but it hasn't been the most powerful one either. A lot of people love Rebels, but it clearly doesn't have the same following that The Clone Wars has. I think that's largely because The Clone Wars really saved the prequel era, while Rebels told another great story in an already great era. A good number of fans just haven't seen this show, so it's hard to argue that it's had this major positive impact. A lot of concept from Rebels were translated elsewhere, like the Inquisitors in other stories or the Ahsoka series pretty much being a Rebels season 5, so that's a good thing. The greatness of Rebels I feel is often overlooked, and because of that I don't think it's had the major positive impact on the franchise that it deserves. I personally love this show with all my heart, and it deserves a 10 out of 10, but because many fans simply haven't seen this show, its impact is going to be a 7 out of 10, and that gives us an average score score of an 8.5 out of 10 for Star Wars Rebels, which is pretty darn good. Before I continue on with the rest of this video, only 11.1% of my viewers are subscribed to this channel. So if you're enjoying this video, please consider subscribing for more content like this. Thank you. Star Wars Resistance. I would be shocked if more than 15% of you watching this video right now have seen Star Wars Resistance. In short, it's not worth your time. The show isn't inherently bad by any means, it's like Solo in that it's quite forgettable. This show is called Star Wars Resistance and barely had anything to do with the Resistance. What the show did well was explore the lives of the random people witnessing the rise of the First Order. But if you thought Rebels was mostly filler, then you haven't seen this show. Of like 20 episodes a season, only five actually mattered. My biggest frustration with the show is that it made no attempt to expand on the characters from the sequel trilogy. What the Clone Wars did for the prequels was flesh out all the characters from those films and make them more three-dimensional than anyone thought possible. Poe Dameron does show up occasionally in this show, but he doesn't get any development. Lucasfilm could have easily made a two-season show about Rey, Finn, and Poe and what they were up to between The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker. They could have used that time to add more layers to those characters that most people were not resonating with. But instead we get a story about random characters and how they like to fly ships. Maybe it's unfair to compare this show to what I wanted it to be, but I can't help but separate my feelings from that. While the box office failure of Solo had multiple consequences, the story itself left close to no impact. And the same could be said for Resistance. You know this Senator Ziono guy from the Ahsoka series? He is actually the father of the main character of Resistance. Kazuda Ziono. And that's probably the biggest impact this series has. The father of the main character showing up in live action. I don't even know how to properly rate something's impact when it pretty much doesn't exist. I could give it a 1, but when I think of a score less than 5, that usually means it had a major negative impact on the franchise. And this show doesn't have a negative impact because no one cares about it. I guess I'll give its impact a 5, which is pretty neutral. The story of the show is incredibly boring and the poster child of missed opportunities opportunity, so I'm going to give it a 3 out of 10, which averages out to a score of 4 out of 10 for Star Wars Resistance. Star Wars The Bad Batch 
I might have some unpopular takes on The Bad Batch. I don't like it at all. I find this show to be a series of disappointing episodes followed by somewhat decent episodes followed by more disappointing episodes. What made this show so exciting was the prospect of studying the clones after the Clone Wars. These were people who were born solely for the purpose of fighting a war. What happens to these soldiers when they no longer have a war to fight? How does that affect them? Well, it turns out all they do is run a bunch of side missions to make money and survive. Boring! Another brilliant idea that this show ignored is how they would feel about their other clone brothers basically becoming droids. After Order 66, the clones lost all their personality. They lost everything that made them great. How would the Bad Batch feel? Well, they don't care about clones, so they have no opinion. Season 2 did start to explore this a bit more with a few episodes with Crosshair, but not enough to make me feel satisfied. Omega is a character I actually quite like, I just feel they haven't done anything interesting with her. I will give the show major credit for killing off Tech. I would have never thought that they would have the balls to kill off one of their main characters, but they do. So while the show does have a few bright spots, overall it's quite disappointing and fails to develop most of its main characters in any meaningful way. The show is getting one more season, so let's hope that can change my mind. Now while I don't like the show, the impact it has left has been mostly positive. This show has continued to breathe life into Star Wars animation, and I've always felt that the animated shows are some of the best things Star Wars has done. The show has resonated with a lot of people, and I can see it gaining a niche following a third season if it's good. It's really tough to judge the impact of this show because the series isn't done. It's still getting that one last season. So in a few years, I'll come back to this thought and let you know if it has left a serious impact. My personal score for this show is a 4 out of 10, and I'll give its impact a temporary 6 out of 10, so that gives the Bad Batch an average of a 5 out of 10. I really hope this last season completely changes my mind on the series. Tales of the Jedi Tales of the Jedi is an interesting thing for me to talk about. I have a lot of built-up anger and frustration, and I think it's more so directed towards people talking about this show, rather than the show itself. Conceptually, I love Tales of the Jedi. Frankly, Tales of the Jedi is what Visions should have been, just a bunch of standalone 20-minute episodes focusing on a different person in the galaxy. When it came to the execution of the first season, it was fine. I found the Dooku episodes to be fairly interesting. The reason this show should exist is to explore characters characters that haven't been explored all that much, and they did that with Dooku. The Ahsoka episodes, on the other hand, I found to be disappointing. The first one is of her as a baby, and literally no one cares to see that. The episode with her training is so overrated. Oh, Ahsoka survived Order 66 because Anakin taught her that move. Like, no shit. I didn't need a 15-minute episode to tell me that. And then the last episode was just a worse version of the Ahsoka novel. I get frustrated that these episodes of the show are only 15 minutes long. Each one should honestly be 30 to 40 minutes and just focus on one character. I pray to God season 2 focuses on an era outside the prequels. Anything besides the prequel characters, please. When I see people put Tales of the Jedi as an S-tier Star Wars show, I get so mad. Because it's not really a show. It's a series of shorts. People just watched Dooku fight Yaddle and instantly thought it was the best thing ever. When in reality, the whole thing was fine and has yet to scratch the surface of its true potential. Regardless of my mild frustration, I do think this show has had a major positive impact on the brand. I've always supported the idea of Star Wars telling shorter stories exploring different characters. You know how Marvel had the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special? I would love it if Star Wars had something like that. And Tales of the Jedi gives me hope that we can get that, in live action or in animation. I just hope we get more and longer episodes in the second season. My personal score for Tales of the Jedi would be a 6, pretty entertaining but nothing special. My impact score would be a 9 out of 10 because there is so much much potential for the future. This averages out to a 7.5 out of 10 for Tales of the Jedi. The Battlefront Games I don't often talk about video games on this channel because I don't feel to be the most qualified person to talk about games, but I thought I'd give my thoughts on the Battlefront franchise because it was a major part of the mid-2010s for Star Wars. Both games were riddled with controversy. The first game barely had any content. Back then, Lucasfilm still avoided the prequels like The Plague, and having a Battlefront game with only the OT stuff was such a bad idea. Battlefront 2 had more promise, but also more controversy. The campaign was pretty underwhelming. It had a lot of promise with telling a story from the perspective 
perspective of Imperials, but of course they had to turn good and ruin that intrigue. It's so difficult to talk about the multiplayer because it started off in such a terrible state, but ended in such a great state. I'll never forget how much outrage there was in the community when we saw the loot box progression system. Reworking that alone took DICE so much time, and then afterwards they were able to do some awesome shit. I loved seeing all the new maps and the characters that people could play. What sucks so much is that right when the game was hitting its stride, EA cut off support. So many games get supported for so many years. Why Battlefront couldn't get that same support is something I will never understand. The impact is also tough to gauge because of the state of the game right now. So many people wanted the game to continue getting support, and with that being the case, I can't wholeheartedly say that the franchise was a disaster. Sure, most of EA's time with Star Wars was riddled with controversy, and to this day, the most disliked post in Reddit history was a post about Battlefront 2, so that has to mean something. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Battlefront 3 is going to happen anytime soon, and that's a huge disappointment. Star Wars has introduced so many new characters and locations, and Battlefront 3 could truly become the perfect Battlefront game. But since we only have these two games, I'm gonna have to give the Battlefront franchise a 5 out of 10. Even though there was so much drama with Battlefront, it did end up in a pretty good state, so I'm gonna give its impact a 6 out of 10, which leaves the average score at a 5.5 out of 10. So much potential that was wasted by bad management from EA. The Cal Kestis Saga Jedi Fallen Order and Jedi Survivor have been nothing short of a major win for the Star Wars franchise. I'm not going to touch on the quality of the gameplay because, again, I'm not really qualified to do that, but I will talk about the stories. Both stories did such a great job at developing Cal Kestis. I loved seeing his development in becoming a true Jedi in the first game, and then seeing all the challenges he faced in the second game. Even alongside Cal, the supporting characters were excellent. Marin was one of my favorite characters. I love her dynamic with Cal, and frankly, I'm so so glad they got together. Sarah was a great master to Cal, and her death was powerful. In both games, the villains were great as well. I don't know who I liked better, Trilla in the first game or Bode in the second game. Both were two completely different characters who were both such great foils to Cal. After the disappointment of the Battlefront 2 campaign, seeing how well these two campaigns were done was a major relief. I'm also glad the campaigns actually took time to complete. Each one was like 15 to 20 hours on normal difficulty, if I remember. I would argue that the impact these games have had is just as great as the games themselves. Before Fallen Order came out, people were shitting on EA for ruining Star Wars video games. And people were right. The whole landscape for Star Wars on the video game front was barren. EA made that comment way back about people not being interested in single player games anymore, and that comment drove people insane. I'll give EA credit though. They realized they were wrong and gave Respawn the green light to make these two single player focused games. Sure, the video game market isn't as bright as it was 20 years ago for Star Wars, but but it's a lot brighter than it was six years ago, and the Jedi games are to thank for that. I think the success of these games is what allowed games like Outlaws to be made, and hopefully that game is good as well. I'm gonna give both the story and its impact of the Cal Kestis games a 9 out of 10, which of course averages to a final score of a 9 out of 10. I cannot wait to see the third installment of this game in a few years, and see if it will wrap up the story as a trilogy, or continue on as a saga. The Mandalorian Season 1 what a perfect introduction to Star Wars TV on Disney+. Plus. What Season 1 did so well was hook the audience right away and tell a rich and captivating story. George Lucas always said that Star Wars was about fathers and sons, so what better way to honor that than by telling this story of a father and his adopted son? The story of the Mandalorian is a simple one. This grizzled, hardened bounty hunter is shown the importance of love through this child. But the Mandalorian does it so well. Back then, we didn't have expectations that these shows would tell some grand story. So the smaller scale of the Mandalorian just wandering the galaxy was done so well. I also love how the season gave Mando multiple character arcs to go on. One is of course his relationship with droids. I love how he hates them all season, but when we see his face for the first time, he's showing his face to a droid. And then of course the other arc is him opening up and embracing a newfound family. The Mandalorian season 1 introduced so many other great supporting characters too, and my personal favorite was easily Quill. His death may be one of the most tragic deaths in 
in Star Wars. This season just nails so many things right. And while not every episode was perfect, the season as a whole was such a great introduction to Star Wars on Disney+. Plus. Now in terms of its impact on the franchise, is there any doubt how impactful this season was? I think that since the introduction of Yoda in The Empire Strikes Back, the smartest thing Star Wars has ever done was introduce a baby Yoda. Grogu became a worldwide phenomenon. His face is now everywhere and he is by far Lucasfilm's biggest cash grab right now. Another thing that made its impact so great was that The Mandalorian was a show you could watch without having seen anything else Star Wars. Sure, you may be missing some of the details with The Empire, but most of the show is fresh and new. I personally know people who got invested into Star Wars because of The Mandalorian. So for reasons like that, this show was a major success. I would give season one a score of nine out of 10, and I would rate its impact a 10 out of 10, giving the season as a whole a 9.5 out of 10. The Mandalorian really ushered Star Wars fans into a new era of this franchise, and in my opinion, it was almost perfect in doing so. The Mandalorian Season 2 Mando Season 2 is just as good as Season 1, if not better. Season 1 left us with a mission for Mando, to find a Jedi. And pretty much all Season 2, the mission is that. Many people criticize The Mandalorian Season 2 for mainly two things. One of them is the repetitive nature of the first five episodes. All these episodes involve Mando wanting something from someone, but he must help that person in order to get what he wants. I don't see this as a problem because each episode tells a vastly unique story from each other. One is helping a marshal on Tatooine, one is helping a frog lady in space, one is helping other Mandalorians, you guys get my point. The other big criticism of this season is the supposed reliance on too many cameos. I agree that Boba Fett showing up was pure fan service, but Bo-Katan, Ahsoka, and Luke were perfect inclusions into the season and only enhanced an already incredible story. My personal favorite episode of the season is Chapter 15, where we see Mando and Bill Burr go on these beautifully written character arcs, but of course it's the finale that broke the internet. Luke showing up was cool, but Mando saying his goodbyes to Grogu was one of the best moments in Star Wars. The whole series had been building up to this moment, and it was perfectly executed. Like season 1, not every episode is perfect, but the story as a whole was so well done. In terms of the impact season 2 left on the franchise, it's a bit interesting. Season 2 of the show expanded the scope of the so-called Mandoverse far more than anyone would have thought. Grogu was now going to train with Luke Skywalker. Bo-Katan was now going to help retake Mandalore. Ahsoka is now looking for Grand Admiral Thrawn. So many new story threads opened up. A lot of people see this as either a good thing or a bad thing, and I see it as mostly a good thing. The direction Favreau and Filoni took these characters after the season may not have been ideal, but I don't think opening up the scope of this show is inherently a bad thing. So because of that, I'm going to give the impact of Season 2 an 8 out of 10. Pretty good, but not perfect. And like Season 1, I would rate season 2 a 9 out of 10, giving us an average of 8.5 out of 10. Now unfortunately a lot of people don't like season 2 anymore because of what came next. And speaking of which, The Book of Boba Fett. Oh boy, where do I begin? This show is a disaster on pretty much every front. First, we have Boba Fett's story. Not only is Boba Fett nothing like the character that people for some reason fell in love with in the first place, but also the story the season tried to tell was so poorly done. For reasons left unclear, Boba Fett wants to become a crime leader so he can bring peace back to Tatooine. And then he goes to war against the Pikes with an army of like eight people. Where many people got excited watching this show was with the episodes focused on Mando. I do think in isolation those two episodes were well done, but of course, why are there two Mandalorian episodes in a show called The Book of Boba Fett? Taking the focus away from Boba Fett essentially made this season a Mandalorian season 2.5, and that was a terrible idea. The finale was maybe the most anticlimactic finale to any season of Star Wars TV. There was no tension at all, and the Pikes proved to be the worst enemy faction in all of Star Wars. But none of that is the biggest sin this show committed, because that award belongs to Mando reuniting with Grogu. Having these two reunite outside the Mandalorian was such a bad idea that sometimes I wonder if Disney forced Favreau to do this. While the show did have some good moments with Boba Fett and the Tusken Raiders, overall the story was a major disappointment, and its impact on Star Wars was borderline devastating. Not only did this show ruin Boba Fett for a lot of people, but it also set up Season 3 of The Mandalorian for major disappointment. It's unfortunate because the story of the show itself is 
rather harmless. Like sure, Boba fighting the Pikes was poorly done, but it wouldn't have done any harm to the franchise. Having Mando reunite with Grogu officially makes The Mandalorian an incomplete show. Watching the finale of Season 2 and then watching Season 3 would be such a jarring experience. You now need to watch other material in order to get the full context. Even worse than that, this decision arguably ruined the ending of Season 2 for a lot of people. When you actively hurt prior stories in your franchise with a new story, that is really bad. So the impact of this show has to be a 2 because it did so much damage to the brand. I won't be as harsh on the story and I'll give it a 4 out of 10. So that averages out to a 3 out of 10 for the book of Boba Fett. Obi-Wan Kenobi a lot of people absolutely hate this show. They say it ruined Obi-Wan and Darth Vader and it broke canon with Leia. I don't see it like that. This show to me is one that's rather mediocre, but it's a show I kinda enjoy watching. The highlights of the show to me are actually what revolves around Obi-Wan. People complain that they're tired of seeing their heroes become broken and then overcoming it, and that's a fair point, but I don't understand what else you could have wanted to see from Obi-Wan in this show. His whole life was shattered and he partially blamed him himself. Expecting him to be completely okay after that is unrealistic, so I loved his arc of him finding himself again. I also felt Vader was done well besides making some rather stupid decisions. Where this show falters almost entirely is with the new characters it introduces, especially Reva. Instead of using Reva to enhance Obi-Wan's story, the writers pretty much want to tell their own story with Reva and it doesn't work at all. Reva is a big part of the show, so that's a major negative. A lot of the directing I found to be quite poor, and it's the only time I felt like a Disney Plus show was handicapped by being on Disney Plus. So the show as a whole is far from the disaster many say it is, but it's not good. The impact this show left on the franchise is unfortunately mostly negative. The Vader vs Obi-Wan fight was a fight most people enjoyed, so that's a positive, but after the sequels, people were tired of seeing their heroes supposedly ruined, and now Obi-Wan ruined more of their heroes. Also since the release of this show, the Disney Plus shows haven't been as popular. That's because Obi-Wan had the biggest draw out of all the show, and when it does doesn't deliver, it's going to tune out a lot of fans from returning. Having shows about legacy characters back-to-back -back flop in Boba Fett and Obi-Wan was terrible for the Star Wars brand. In the year that the show has been out, it's kinda just faded away except to those who really hated it. With my score, I'd give Obi-Wan a 6 out of 10. Again, I didn't hate it, and I did mostly enjoy it. The impact this show has left is not as bad as, say, the Book of Boba Fett's, but it's still pretty bad, so I'll give it a 4 out of 10. And that averages out to a 5 out of 10 for Obi-Wan. Juan Kenobi. Andor. Andor is the grand slam that Star Wars needed. For once, Lucasfilm decided to completely move away from that typical Star Wars feel and tell a drama about how a man becomes ready to commit himself to a rebellion. Andor probably has the best character work in the entire franchise. The show takes its time over the course of 12 episodes to completely sell you on the character arc of Cassian. After his travels on Aldani and especially the prison, he is no longer willing to stand by and let the Empire rule. He needs to stop it. The whole prison sequence and especially the episode No Way Out, has some of the best written moments in not just Star Wars, but in television I've seen recently. From Luthen's speech to Kino Loy's speech, this show just makes you want to rebel with them. The show develops plenty of other characters outside of Cassian too, like Mon Mothma and Luthen. What frustrated a lot of fans about this show was how good it looked and how Obi-Wan did not look that good. I get that Obi-Wan should be the top priority of Lucasfilm, but at the end of the day, I can't criticize Andor for being the best looking show on Disney+. Everything about this show is perfect. While it doesn't feel like typical Star Wars, it captures all those themes of rebellion in Star Wars so brilliantly. I love this show and I am dying for season 2. What's peculiar about the impact this show has had is that it's mostly loved, but it still hasn't had the impact that, say, The Mandalorian has had. A lot of Disney Star Wars haters love Andor, but instead of seeing it as a positive for the brand, they see it as an exception to the brand. Also, the viewership numbers weren't great for this show, and I wonder if it's because it has borderline no appeal to younger audiences. Similar to The Bad Batch, this show is also not yet complete, so we'll have to wait until Season 2 concludes before we can truly judge its impact. It should be no surprise to anyone that my score for Andor is going to be a 10 out of 10. It was perfectly written, and I can rewatch it at almost any time. Its impact on the franchise was by no means negative, but it didn't feel like it changed the direction of the franchise all that much. So I'm going to give its impact an 8 out of 10, pretty good but not fantastic, and this of course averages out to a 9 out of 10 for Andor. The Mandalorian Season 3 
I hate The Mandalorian Season 3. This season is so bad compared to the other two seasons. Going into it, I already had major issues about Grogu and Mando being reunited off screen. I had come to terms with that, and while I knew it would be awkward, I was ready to ignore it and embrace the new story they were trying to tell. But there was no story the writers wanted to tell. This season has no focused story by any means. The characters just meander around until the end of the fifth episode where they all agree they should make an attempt to retake Mandalore. And then they do so rather easily. So many things in the season were resolved in such a disappointing way. Season 2 ended with tension between Mando and Bo-Katan because of the Darksaber. How would that story point play out? Bo-Katan would end up getting it back over a technicality. Moff Gideon has been after Grogu in his blood all series. What is he planning? Oh, an army of clones of himself that all get killed by the push of a button. How will Grogu tie into the story now that he's back with Mando? He won't because Grogu's inclusion in the season was solely for marketing purposes. And that's why why this season is so frustrating. I feel like the writers needed to make a Mando season 3 with Grogu, so they kinda just forced shit in that didn't feel natural to the story. This to date remains my least favorite season of Star Wars TV on Disney+. And since a lot of people agree with me, the impact the show has left has certainly been negative. People through all the drama of the sequels or Obi-Wan or Boba Fett at least had the Mandalorian they could go to for good storytelling. The first two seasons had such good stories and such compelling character arcs that a third season season must also have that, right? Wrong. Season 3 was so bad that a good portion of people who were fans of the show probably don't care to see a season 4. At least season 3 did wrap up this arc for Mando, so in season 4 they can have a fresh start. I hate this season of The Mandalorian and I'm gonna give it a 3 out of 10. Its impact I wouldn't say was as damaging as The Book of Boba Fett's because it didn't actively hurt previous seasons, but its impact was bad so I'm still gonna give it a 3 out of 10 score, which averages out to a 3 out of 10. Season 4 really needs to bounce back to the Mandalorian we all know and love. Ahsoka Ahsoka is another example of one of these shows that I seem to like more than most people. Ahsoka to me told a compelling story in a completely messy way. Ahsoka and Sabine both have these interesting arcs that tie into their pasts nicely, but Filoni approached these arcs kinda with mystery boxes. We're told all season that these two used to train together but then had a falling out, and we don't find out why until the last episode. Also for the first half of the season, Ahsoka acts like this grumpy woman, and we don't find out why she's like that until the fifth episode. Episode. Leaving viewers in the dark on why your characters are flawed is a bad idea. Now where the show works for me is the depiction of all the animated characters. I loved seeing Hera, Ezra, and Thrawn back from Rebels. A lot of people don't like Thrawn because they think he's dumb, but at least we can all agree Lars Mikkelsen's performance was excellent. Balin and Shin were also two new interesting characters that I look forward to seeing in the future. It's a little tough to look at the impact the season has left because it concluded only weeks before the release of this video, but overall I think it's been mixed. To those who already feel disenfranchised with Star Wars, this show is probably not going to change anything for you. But if you're a big fan of Rebels and the Clone Wars, then you'll probably at least be satisfied with the story they told. What this show did well was set up the future of this Mandalorian era of Star Wars. With Thrawn back in the galaxy and Sabine and Ahsoka stranded on Peridia, there are plenty of things to look forward to with the future of the franchise. There's rumors that the next show, Skeleton Crew, will also tie into this, so that gives me something in the future to also look forward to. We all know that this will eventually lead into Dave Floney's Star Wars movie. So Ahsoka Season 1 was just the first step into setting us up for that story. Ahsoka at the end of the day is a heavily flawed show, but I'm not gonna lie that my biases allowed me to really enjoy the season. So for that reason, I'm gonna give it a 7 out of 10. Flawed, but mostly pretty good. Its impact had a few negatives, but more positives in my opinion. So I'll give that a score of a 6 out of 10, which averages out to a 6.5 out of 10. Now that we have concluded the 19 major projects from Disney Star Wars, we can average them all together for a final score. If we take these 19 scores, they all average out to a 6.45 out of 10. I know this is kinda a weird way to grade Disney's tenure with Star Wars. Obviously, each one of the sequel movies should hold more weight than, say, Star Wars Resistance or Tales of the Jedi. Also, there were some things I didn't talk about, like some of the video games, and I didn't talk about the books or comics or Star Wars Visions. I could spend some time discussing Kathleen Kennedy, 
and the ever so present issues she's been having with having to fire people. But I'm not going to sit here and give you this complex algorithm that properly weighs everything. My final score for Disney Star Wars is a 6.45 out of 10. To me, that means it's seriously flawed, but there is a fair amount of good, and a lot of it can be seriously enjoyed. So what do you guys think? Do you think I was being fair here, or am I still completely wrong in a few places? Let me know down below. Thank you everyone so much for watching another one of my videos. Don't forget to hit the Claude Squad, and I will see you guys next time.